That Sunday in 1958, when I left St. Louis, I sat in my coach seat in Union Station quite a while, going over my parents' instructions in my mind. I was to change trains in Cleveland that night and take another train to Boston. Once in Boston, early the next morning, I was to take a taxi to North Station, where I would board a third train north to a small New Hampshire town that I, my parents, and my nine siblings had never seen. As the train pulled slowly out of the station into the darkness of the tunnel, I wasn't conscious of the fact that there had not been any special goodbyes to Al, Willie, or any of my other brothers or sisters. As the engine sped up and we emerged once more into the bright September morning, I could see the bridge over the Mississippi River into Illinois. I tried to imagine the new world I was about to enter, and as the train hung there above the current, tears began to flow down my cheeks. I looked back at the smokestacks from St. Louis factories, reached for my handkerchief and buried my face in it against the window so that none of the people around me could notice how the confident smile I'd worn during mom's and dad's farewell had disappeared. Uh, that of course um, is from the haircut and I have to thank my leader, the first, uh, workshop leader from the Kenyan workshop, Rebecca McCullaghan, who just last week in a conversation about this book pointed out to me why this is such an important way to introduce this work. Um, the, the main reason why I picked that passage from the first part of the book, which is called Get the Boy on the Train, um, is that I believe the scene captures a kernel of the overall emotional theme of the story. There you have this young boy looking forward to this place that he's going to, yet looking back and then finally realize experiencing what William Faulkner described as problems of the human heart in conflict with himself. I always liked slow dancing with Lilo, the bluesy crooning from the high five, the high fidelity record player in the far corner of our living room. When my impromptu lessons in the fine art of rhythmic movement began, Lilo was 17, rouged cheeks, penciled eyebrows, glamorous. I was nine, skinny, and nearly bald from a recent haircut, the cliche of a pesty little brother in my striped pullover shirt in the brown corduroy pants. As I gazed up at my sister's coffee and cream face, suddenly aware of the scrawny curve of my arms around her, I recall thinking wistfully how she always looked ready for a party. The wailing lyrics of the song, its swirl of clarinets, piano, and saxophone sounded like something we have listened to before on the radio. Am I blue? You be too. Lila would retrace her steps until she stood in front of me again, her wide checkered skirt whispering softly against me as though it, through an apple red smile, she commanded, let's try that again, but this time you leave. As she closed her eyes and hummed familiar tune, a familiar tune, she could sense my intended direction before my body had a chance to signal where I was going. I didn't feel like I was leading. Rather, we were two fish floating side by side through the wavering tide of music that filled the living room. If your dreams, like your scheme, don't come true. Leela was still at Make Lab and the Sunday morning I left for Exeter in the fall of 1958. She sat across the kitchen table from me and watched me eat breakfast. After everyone else left the table, she asked with a mixture of sadness and excitement, Larry, are you nervous about going away? Nope, I answered casually. And why didn't you eat all your breakfast, she queried, seriously, studying my face. Before I could stutter something about not being hungry, she went on, I've never seen you not eat all your breakfast. She looked tenderly at me and dropped into silence. She rose from her chair, walked around to where I was sitting and stood beside me for a moment, then slowly put her arm across my back and squeezed my shoulder. It's okay to feel scared about leaving home. Don't ignore your feelings.
I pointed out the nearby buildings as we meandered toward the Harvard Yard. That's a private club, one of the finals club. Even John Kennedy couldn't get into one of them because he was Catholic. That's Adam's house. That newer building, mid-sentence, mom's hand seized my right shoulder. She pulled me out of the middle of the sidewalk, sloping up toward the yard to allow some undergraduates and their parents and guests to pass us. She pierced my exuberant eyes, then glanced over my shoulder to death, causing me to turn to see him moving gingerly up the sidewalk behind us. She dropped her hand to my forearm and squeezed it. Her eyes exuded both pleading and determination. Larry, she hissed through her teeth, your father has waited his entire life to see you graduate from Harvard, and you're going to slow down. I looked back at Dad, his cane suddenly appearing as a third leg hinged to his right hip. He limped toward us. His thick gray black eyelashes curved down toward the crow's feet at the sides of his tinkling eyes. His Clark Gable mustache arched above his wide grin when he noticed me looking at him. His Panama hat cast a slight shadow graying his brown forehead. A dark charcoal gray suit encased his white shirt and striped gray and red tie. His compact five foot six inch body looked less rotund than I remembered. He had lost some weight since I entered college. For a moment, I didn't see my father, but a handsome old man, he was 67 years old at the time, whose eyes brimmed with pleasure and pain. Walking was very difficult, but like a toddler, he did his best to catch up to us in the June heat of a sunny Cambridge day. As he approached, the joy in his eyes became more visible. I thought to myself, the contentment beaming from his face has something to do with me, not only as mom had implied my graduation from Harvard. All the resentment I'd stored up against him for his resistance to my going to Exeter and his failure to fully support me economically melted away. I walked back down the sidewalk to where dad had stopped perhaps to catch his breath, and hooked my right arm until his left. My breathing slowed, our pace synchronized into whatever was flowing between our bodies. I chose that piece partially because 100 years ago this month, in May of 1920, my father graduated from um, Arkansas Baptist College, a small, uh, historically black institution um, which trained ministers and others in the liberal arts. My father took the academic uh, program rather than the ministerial program. But um, one thing that the, the book ends with my father's death, when I think I'm beginning to be able to see him as a human being and his struggles and appreciate uh, what it must have been like to lose everything, including his civil service job at the Foreign uh, Security Administration, have eight kids, and then migrate to St. Louis just before I was born. 